Joining us now to discuss is Don Coffin. He's a co-founder of Training Educator Theater Trade and James Butterfield. He's a head of research at CoinShares. Welcome, Don and James, to the show. Hi. So I guess first off the bat, hello. I want to address, uh, you know, Bitcoin's uh, falling like a rock right now. What's going on, <clears throat> Don? Yeah, one of, the, one of the first things I'd like to discuss is the fact that uh, oversold right now really doesn't mean very much in this marketplace. And you can see that, you know, both in equity and index markets referencing the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, where they're looking at Bitcoin, you know, the correlation has kind of broken apart lately between, you know, Bitcoin, for instance, and the NASDAQ. But the interesting irony is that on down days inside of the NASDAQ or down days in the S&Ps, there's no question uh, Bitcoin is definitely playing a role in, uh, in downside correlation to the marketplace. I mean, trade today. And again, I'm, I'm much more of the trader here. Trade today, it's broken, it's disconnected, it's edgy. Uh, that break below uh, 19,000 was just downright violence in, uh, in trade. And uh, again, that, that oversold terminology that I've consistently heard, you know, uh, day in and day out right now, it's out the window. I think that today is a very critical trading session, not only for uh, index and ETFs, but uh, also, of course, the crypto marketplace. What do you think is the catalyst for that today for the uh, broader U.S. equities and how that is impacting uh, Bitcoin right now, Don? Is it the, I just see that the U.S. services sector expanded last month at a faster rate than expected, according to the uh, August ISM manufacturing index coming in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm looking at a lot of the economic data coming in, but it's nothing more than a catalyst. I mean, for the most part, you're throwing matches at a pool of gasoline in this marketplace day in and day out. <clears throat> really, in today's move in the broader markets, to me, it's about U.S. Treasuries. It's about interest rates. If you look at the bond market, it's it's horrendous out there right now. Uh, the bonds are down another full uh, two points. Uh, rates are coming up. So for the most part, what we're seeing is anything that's involving in, in growth, it's, uh, it's a tough story. The other thing is with rising rates, you've got this, this carry trade, which you know all of the miners use as well. And it's unraveling in front of our eyes. As the, uh, the cost of carry goes up, it is difficult to support some of the trade opportunities that existed just a few weeks or a few months ago in a rising interest rate environment. It may not be worth it you know, when a two-year is sitting at 3.5%. Do you really want to carry uh, overnight? And again, it unwinds a number of uh, very key trades inside of the crypto marketplace. All right. Now, we brought in James over to talk about this Ethereum merge and how it will impact Bitcoin. So, so James, from a, a Bitcoin perspective, uh, you know, all the talk of the town has been about <clears throat> Ethereum today with the Bellatrix upgrade that happened this morning. What do you think the ultimate impact on Bitcoin will be? Um, actually, I think the merge has brought to light certain issues um, that maybe you could call them problems with Ethereum, uh, predominantly one of centralization. It suddenly becomes uh, more vulnerable from a political perspective. There is a leader of the Ethereum Foundation, and that leader can be, can be influenced. So I think it actually, in some respects, will be in, in the longer term supportive for Bitcoin. Um, you know, I think some of the advantages of Bitcoin in this um, in this instance are that you know people can join and leave at any time. It has this inherent randomness. Uh, the chain will never halt, any like uh, proof of stake chains could. Um, but I think people are quite excited right now uh, about the merge. It looks like it will be successful. I think now it's being brought forward to because of. Miners are mining like crazy at the moment. So if you look at the hash power in Ethereum, it's, it's rising. It's a bit like an engine running out of gas at the last moment. It really starts to pick up speed. And I think that's what the, the miners are doing. And as a consequence, mm -hmm. the date now has probably been brought forward to probably the 14th or maybe 15th of September, slightly governed by the mining, the number of miners. And so that's increasing that certainty that it's going to happen. I think, you know, just now, the spotlight is very much on Ethereum, um, but it's complicated. There are other issues to consider, like proof of work. Um, we're certainly seeing sure. a pickup in prices for Ethereum Classic, for instance. To J James, on that end, um, what if the Ethereum merge succeeds, proof of stake succeeds? Will Bitcoin have an ex existential crisis? Well, I mean, I think other proof-of-stake uh, coins have never really succeeded. Um, but if any of them are going to succeed, it's Ethereum. I think that the strategy, if you can call it that, of being initially proof-of-work 
deriving some sort of value, building a significant network, because that is, with all cryptos, at the bottom line is the size of the network. And Ethereum has that, that large network. It has roughly wow. two to 3,000 active developers um, on a monthly trading basis. So it is becoming a, a very active network. And so it's earned its place, uh, you could argue, in some respects. So if any of them are going to work, uh, Ethereum will. If you look at um, the, the stakers now, there are well north of 400,000 stake, stakers now, which is more than actually Ethereum miners. So it will, once it moves to the merge, retain that. Um, but it still has those challenges, and it only takes uh, something like uh, significant political influence over the Ethereum Foundation to create some sort of wobbles, some sort of worries. Um, that said, as well, the merge is quite a lengthy process. People can't just dump their staked ETH immediately. They have to wait between 6 to 12 months before they do that, and then there'll be a queue. It's a slow process. Um, so in my mind, I think in the longer term, uh, those... I think we'll see them very uh, Bitcoin become more defined. I think they're not really comparable in many ways. So Bitcoin is really a store of value um, and a medium of exchange where I, I feel Ethereum on very simple terms is a bit like Amazon Web Services, but with a currency rolled into it. So two very different things. So I don't think the two will overlap each other in the longer term too much. Interesting. Uh, Don, want to have you weigh in here. What are your thoughts on the Ethereum merge and how it will impact Bitcoin? Notably, if, you know, if it fails or if there are problems, do you think folks will flood into Bitcoin or it will impact Bitcoin in the sense that, you know, all cryptocurrencies will uh, sustain some sort of damage and stigma and it'll uh, have an impact on the whole crypto market? Right. So I'm a, I'm a bit of a trader at heart. So uh, just the very fact that uh, we're mentioning, you know, six to nine months out, that's not going to do it for me. If I'm not liquid, I got to be in, I got to be out in, uh, in mere minutes. You know, uh, that, uh, that marketplace, again, just wouldn't be a place for me. I don't think there's going to be that much crossover at this point. Um, this is something that I have not, per se, heard a lot of buzz about. Uh, but again, I'm much more on the trading realm and trading side of this thing, whereas I'm not sitting here and in, in holding it as a store of, of anything in terms of uh, you know my Bitcoin, um, you know I'm not looking for valuation necessarily to increase. I'm trading volatility right now, and as a trader, the only thing we want to hear is stabilization. And this makes me extremely nervous as a trader. This is a marketplace. There's no question. You know I'm uh, I'm gonna it's gonna stave off a lot of the traders. You know and we're probably gonna watch this. But on the bright side of it, <laughs> it may very well bring some volatility uh, back to the marketplace. And if you actually you know if you're looking at crypto, just the, you know this summer, uh, the volatility has not necessarily been there. It's subsided a lot, which is actually a little disconcerting, as you were saying just a moment ago. Also, the number of dormant uh, coins out there is is dramatic. Again, I don't look at that necessarily as a positive, as a net positive. I want to see some of that dormancy come to a uh, screeching halt right now. The more participants, the better for the marketplace. But again, anything <clears throat> that's going to tie me up for a period of time in a marketplace is not going to be uh, a place where I am going to be uh, in and out of considerable. It's just it's just not so going to be there for us. So that does that mean you're just going to stay away from Ethereum or it's also going to impact your outlook on other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? So, yeah, yeah, I would absolutely stay away from it from the time being. I mean, some of the trades that I like to do, again, they're volatility type trades where, you know, you're long Bitcoin, you know, short like an Ethereum, but I'm much more into the derivative side of the business. But uh, listening to this in the very near term, yeah, no, I think I have to uh, have to avoid to some degree, uh, especially if that turbulence is going to shut down my ability to rapidly enter and exit a marketplace. Uh, as I was saying a moment ago, you know, you have this this huge cost of carry and that's it's something that a lot a lot of people are not taking into account for the miners where everything, I mean, we're talking about inflation, everything is going against them at this point in time. And on top of it, to compound the issue, you've got some of the crypto marketplace headed down presently. It is, uh, it is again, a very, very fast tentative situation in these marketplaces. And the most important thing to me, again, as a trader, and that's somebody that's in and out pretty consistently here, is again, that ability to, uh, you know, 24 seven to, uh, to whack a position if need be. So anything that's going to tie me up, uh, even for a few minutes, minutes is, uh, is a marketplace that most traders in the short duration would stay away from. All right. Uh, James, so if you continue to see Ethereum being used as a, 
you know, having actual use cases and, and Bitcoin continuing to have a store of value. Do, do you see, do you see it ever, ever there being a flippening of any sorts because Ethereum is being used so much? And, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, the impact on Bitcoin, what that might be. I, I think they're just defining themselves. You know, we have many uh, clients. We have around three and a half billion dollars of assets under management. And it's interesting speaking to them and asking their opinion. Mm -hmm. And they are really starting to see a difference between the two. They see that Ethereum offers services such as decentralized finance, some sort of identity protection, and lots of apps you can build with, on it. Uh, conversely, they see Bitcoin as something that is a store of value. It's, it's a stateless asset, I think, is one of the best ways to put it. And it's a hedge against potentially faltering monetary policy. We are in this massive monetary policy experiment that's ending now with quantita uh, quantitative tightening. No one really quite knows how it's going to end. It seems to be going okay at the moment. And theoretically, the US economy looks to be on a fairly even uh, keel uh, considering uh, what's happening. But it could all unwind quite uh, in an ugly way. So people see Bitcoin as a hedge against that. And, you know, we've seen many use cases, certainly in places like Ukraine, where we saw a 250% rise in Bitcoin volume growth. Um, shortly after the conflict hit. So it's a great way to walk across the border with assets. I, I think Ethereum just represents something, among, particularly amongst our clients, something quite different. Um, so I increasingly see them as distinct assets. And, you know, Ethereum has, could actually lead, I don't know about flipping, but it could lead to, um, any potential rally towards the end of the year. Um, although I would argue I'm still quite bearish, not necessarily because any failure for emerge but you know we see bitcoin in particular has a 70 percent inverse correlation to the dxy that's a trade weighted dollar against its key trade uh, tr trade trading partners and um that since 2018 it's had that high correlation so whatever happens to the dollar has a big effect on bitcoin and and you know we um uh, we talked about um the uh, the carry trade earlier that's one element of it um and and I think the dollar now, on many respects, looks overvalued. But certainly if we compare to, say, the Volcker era of the early 1980s, it could carry on appreciating. Um, and um, so, yeah, while it's overvalued, it could, towards the end of this year, I think it's still not particularly a particularly positive outlook uh, for Bitcoin. Um, for that reason, no flippening, but Ethereum could outperform or continue to outperform. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Don, I know you have some thoughts on the dollar. And if you want to add to that, you're at look at toward the end of the year for Bitcoin. Yeah. So the uh, the dollar right now, I mean, today is the breakout trade of the day. <clears throat> the dollar's exploding higher. I mean, where do you want to be right now in the world? And you have to ask yourself that. When I say where do you want to be, I mean, you're going to be in the euro? Absolutely not. Uh, you're going over to the yen, it's getting demolished right now. You're not going into any Chinese yuan. I mean, where in this world can you go right now to be a safe haven? And unfortunately, that, uh, that answer is the dollar, which is going to continually put some pressure into the crypto marketplace. Uh, there's no question uh, pressure continues in the overall. I, my outlook on the economy is not uh, nearly as uh, as rosy as uh, as our guest oh, here. Oh, I'm not rosy. Um, I'm not rosy. No? <laughs> oh, that's good. This is good. So uh, we, um, you know, if you look at financial markets and, and interest rates being jammed up, the one thing the Fed has continually stated, they're actually willing to go out and break financial instruments. Uh, and that includes crypto in here. And again, I don't think we've actually been through that pain. We haven't seen that anguish. Like I haven't actually looked at the marketplace in a long time and say, you know, I'm feeling the fear. Again, I come from a trading background. And uh, and that's what we look for in the trading background. Implied volatility skyrocketing, feeling the fear. As you were seeing dormant coins out there, they got to come to life, right? For us to capitulate, I mean, we have to see just that. You got to feel the fear in this marketplace. And again, we're just not there. And I've said that pretty consistently time and again uh, since the beginning of the year. We've been fairly accurate. The break into 18,000 will be pivotal. That's why I was saying, like, literally today's session is a bit more pivotal session and pivotal week. And I think people uh, give it respect for. But for now, as I say, you know, uh, oversold in the marketplace doesn't seem to matter. Overbought in the dollar doesn't seem to matter. We have to kind of redefine what uh, what you might believe about this marketplace. But in the near term, it's uh, again not a uh, not a pretty outlook for uh, for crypto. Can I just right, can I add bearish? to that? Go, of course. Yeah, I mean, I I think there are some keys and macroeconomic triggers you can look at. Um, 
you know, at what point will the Fed pivot? Many people thought it would be Jackson Hole, but clearly it wasn't. Um, I think what the Fed is doing, many central banks tend to fall into this trap as well of um, being too reactive rather than proactive to interest rates. So they should have been hiking rates this time last year and they didn't, they, they waited. And now inflation's run a little bit out of control and they're aggressively hiking rates. And on the other end of it, they tend to hike rates for too long. And um, they are focusing on factors that are influenced by hiking interest rates a lot later. So core CPI is one of them, uh, personal income and payrolls and uh, other factors people keep on looking at and saying, okay, those figures look okay still, but uh, they are the last to respond to rising interest rates. What we should be looking right. at is the national home builders data, uh, building permits, the ISM, those kind of things. Uh, for any triggers. So I think towards the end of the year, keep a sharp eye on things like the ISM and um, uh, permits and consumer confidence. If we start to see those wobbles, I think it really tells you that the Fed's in trouble and the US economy is, is, is going to sink into recession.